Good morning, everyone. There's quite a bit of red in the crowd. I think I had everyone beat. I rode my electric scooter to work this morning, and my ears are just now thawing out. That, yeah, the wind chill out there. I didn't wear a hat, so that's, that's my bad. So I was celebrating Red Sunday on a different level with that about 30 minutes ago. So yeah, Super Bowl today. Enjoy it. Uh, those who want to compete, because you can't compete in the Super Bowl, you're not a football player, but if you want to pe compete in the Super Bowl, you're, you're welcome to compete alongside me. Basically, that's where you eat as much junk food as you can and still try to make it into school or work on time the next morning. So good luck with that. I'll be competing, and I'm probably going to win, just an FYI. All right, if you want to go ahead and throw up the picture, um, so this is Zaniah in the middle there. So uh, there's uh, yeah, our connection with families in Dallas. I'm with Jim Elam and Newfound Life Church. So Zaniah and her brother is not pictured, but his name is Javance. And they have had, this has been on the prayer line for the last week, I believe, but they've had foundation issues with their house. Um, so their, their foundation is actually crumbling and falling apart. Um, they've been out without uh, water for weeks now. It's been damaging their plumbing. So what we've been, um, yeah, what we've been tasked to do and um, and gladly doing it. Um, their estimated cost to fix that is about 2500 and so far we've received about 1800 for that, so we need about $700 more um, to bless this family that um, a lot of people here in, in our church have connected with and care about. Um, and if we would receive more than that 700 that's still needed, um, that would go into um, a caring fund to help out future needs um, with Dallas families that we're connected to. Uh, the contractor is going to start tomorrow. Um, so that is good news, but there is still, still a need to be able to meet that um, to bless this family. Um, we are also going to take communion this morning. So if you're in the, in the sanctuary, there are um, little cups with the wafers out in the foyer if you need one, if you missed one, and online. Um, those who are watching online at home, if you want to gather elements so we can participate together, um, go ahead and do that. Um, let's go ahead and pray. Dear Lord, just thank you for um, just the morning you've given us, the, the blessing it is to wake up. Um, your mercies are new each, each morning, each day. Uh, thank you for all the ways that you're working um, here in Hillsboro, in Dallas, um, and all the other places we're connected, Lord. Um, there's constantly um, things that are coming up, um, needs and different things that uh, really, Lord, just draw us into how much um, we need you. Um, this earth is not our home. This is a temporary place um, that we can find enjoyment and joy in a lot of things, but um, our identity lies in the hope that we have in you um, and eternity with you. Uh, just pray for our offering this morning, Lord, just with all the ways that we're connected. Um, yeah, just, just like with this morning, just to, to bless people that we're connected to, um, that um, we care about the, the global church, not just uh, the people here um, sitting in our sanctuary in our town, Lord, but um, we are connected to to much more than just what's around us. Uh, may we be ever, um, our eyes be ever open to, to the ways that we can uh, to, to support and love your church, Lord. Uh, we love you, Lord, and give this morning to you. In Jesus' name, amen.
uh, she tried to throw me for a loop today. She did throw me for a loop because uh, I, I like to play Name That Tune with the, with the song during the offertory, and uh, she played one that I do not know. Anybody know that song? Yeah, shout it out. Is that, sorry? The Light of the World is Jesus. Nope, nope, we, we did not get a winner there. Uh, how about, but, that, but thanks for playing. Uh, Dorothy? All right. She can't think of it right now, but she knows it. All right, yeah. It, something with the precious name of Jesus, uh, right? And uh, I, I talked to Karen ahead of time, so I already knew going into it that I wasn't going to know it, uh, the answer. Um, yeah, somebody's playing in the Super Bowl today, and uh, so we're excited about that. I got my, my Chiefs socks, and we adopted the Chiefs when we moved here because we didn't have a team in L.A., at the time, and we like to root for the home team. So, and then his jacket. Uh, my grandfather, Ray, brought, bought this jacket for my older brother when he was a sophomore in high school. So I'm fitting into a sophomore's jacket. It's pride. It's gonna. It's gonna probably don't don't clap because it's gonna it's gonna rip probably at some point during the message. Uh, but yeah, he bought uh, me. My twin brother and uh, our best friend, bright green jackets, when we were in sixth grade, because we were part of a group, we were, we were the group Trinity Brass. I played the trombone, the other two played the trumpet in church, and uh, so we would wear our bright green blazers for that. But I stole my older brother's red jacket, because he left it at, our, at my parents' house. All right, kids, uh, let's see if uh, we can... It's going to be a little harder last week because we didn't really have a whole lot of a story so much, but uh, we talked about the church life and what happens uh, in, the, in the church. And so let's see, if, if anybody can think of when, when the church comes together, what is something that the church should do? What is something that the church should do? Yeah, Ethan. Pray. Yes, that was one of our good job. Prayer. That's a big one. We need to be praying, praying for the lost, praying for each other. People knew that this guy had been born uh, this way, that he was familiar to them, always begging. So this would have stood out. You know, you couldn't just write this off and say, oh, this is a fake miracle, because there were fake magicians, that, you know, all the time. Uh, people doing things to counterfeit miracles. And uh, you couldn't say that because they knew that this guy had never walked before. It couldn't be somebody who just pretended to be lame. And then uh, Peter healed him, you know, healed him and made this kind of show that they did to try and attract people. No, this was a, a legitimate miracle that people would have known uh, or would have, they would have known him. And so they would have recognized that this was an actual miracle. Let's continue then. Uh, it says, while the man held on to Peter and John, all the people were astonished and came running to them in the place called Solomon's Colonnade. When Peter saw this, he said to them, fellow Israelites, why does this surprise you? Why do you stare at us as if by our own power or godliness we had made this man walk? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob the God of our fathers has glorified his servant Jesus. You hand him, handed him over to be killed, and you disowned him before Pilate, though he had decided to let him go. You disowned the holy and righteous one and asked that a murderer be released to you, Barabbas. You killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead. We are witnesses of this. By faith in the name of Jesus, this man whom you see and know was made strong. It is Jesus' name and the faith that comes through him that has com uh, completely healed him, as you can all see. Now, fellow Israelites, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did your leaders. But this is how God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets saying that his Messiah would suffer. Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out. The times of refreshing may come from the Lord. 
and that he may send the Messiah, talking about the second coming, who has been appointed for you, even Jesus. Heaven must receive him until the time comes. So for now, he's, he's exalted, as we talked about a couple weeks ago. For God to restore everything, as he promised long ago through the holy prophets. For Moses said, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own people. You must listen to everything he tells you. Anyone who does not listen to him will be completely cut off from their people. Indeed, beginning with Samuel, all the prophets who have spoken have foretold these days. And you are heirs of the prophets and of the covenant God made with your fathers. He said to Abraham, through your offspring, all the peoples of the earth will be blessed. When God raised up his servant, he sent him first to you to bless you by turning each of you from your wicked ways. This week we're going to look at the, the, the healing and the sermon, and then next week uh, we'll look at the results uh, and the response to that. Let's pray. Father God, we ask this morning that you would teach us from your word. Help us to understand uh, what it is that you want to say to us through this story, through this event that took place uh, in Jerusalem 2,000 years ago and still has significance in our lives today. We give you this time. We dedicate it to you, Lord, to, to, to speak in our lives, to help us to be the vessels, the servants that you have called us to be. In Jesus' name, amen. So here we see <clears throat> Peter and John, like, you know, for the first time we're kind of seeing them acting just like Jesus, right? Uh, the, the Holy Spirit came down on them in Pentecost. Uh, it talks, you know, gives a summary of, of how all these people got saved. 3,000 were added to the church. We see a little bit of the body life, a description of the body life. But now we see Peter and John doing a miracle that was so reminiscent of Jesus. Wow, it's like, it's like, like Jesus is back again. And he was, right, through the, the resurrected Lord was working through his people in his resurrection power. And, and, and Luke is showing us this, that, yeah, Jesus is alive and well. We got Peter and John going up to the temple to pray. pray. As we talked about last week, the church, they met in the temple and in homes. So they would have large gatherings at the temple. Here they were going up to pray. pray. We don't know if, um, if they were going to have a, a gathering after this, if that was a time when they all, uh, the church congregated. Uh, but this was a Jewish thing. They, they hadn't divorced themselves from Judaism at this point. Uh, Christianity is um, an extension of Ju Judaism. Judaism is not as supposed to be, have been a separate religion Christianity was the, supposed to be the fulfillment of Judaism. And so, uh, you know, they, they didn't say, hey, we're not going to do anything else, that, anything that has to do, do with uh, Judaism anymore, because they were Jews. And so it was normal to go up at the third hour to pray at the temple, and they were, they were doing that. So their mind is set. Peter's, you know, on his way, he and John, uh, to, to go together, maybe meeting up with the rest of the church. That would be... Probably likely, possibly he was going to preach a sermon again, you know, do some teaching to the people. So he probably had his mind on what he was going to say. But, you know, he's thinking about what he's going to do. And here's a crippled man in the road begging. And he asks them for, for money. It would have been easy for them just to keep going on. They, they, their, their focus was on, on the time of prayer and what they had to do. Be easy to walk past, but they didn't. They recognized the opportunity that was before them, and they seized it. How often do we miss these opportunities? Point number one, 
We need to walk in the Spirit in such a way that we recognize the opportunities that He presents. We need to be walking in the Spirit in such a way that we recognize the opportunities that are before us, that we're looking for the opportunities to be used by the Spirit. I um, used to live in Russia, as, I, as you know. And uh, my first time that I was there, the first two-year time uh, that I was there, as a, just out of college, um, my, we had a team of four. There was two guys, two girls. The two, two of us guys, we went to college together. My best friend, John, who is six foot six. He's this big guy and uh, always made me look small. The, 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 the teachers at the, the, the university would call, call us Tom and Jerry because John and Jeremy sounded to them like Tom and Jerry, and he was big and I was small. And, uh, but we, you know, we, we, we cut our hair because we, we, we did our own haircuts there. So I brought clippers. I shaved my head. We both sh- you know, shaved our heads real close. And at that time is when, uh, remember the Chechen war that was going on, the rebels in Chechnya and such? And we were in southern Russia, which was near Chechnya. And so there was a lot of mixture of uh, different kinds of uh, former uh, Soviet Union people there, peoples, and Chechens were there and stuff. And the mafia was big. Our town, Rostov, was called Papa Mafia. Uh, uh, Odessa, Ukraine, was Mama Mafia, and we were Papa Mafia. It was a big mafia city. And we, we shaved our heads and uh, just out of convenience. And our professors, the Russian professors, they told us that we looked like mafia and Chechen mafia uh, because of our haircuts. And so we didn't think anything of it. You know, not, and, and sometimes uh, as we were riding in the trolley or the buses and stuff, and they would come to collect money, they would skip over my friend. They wouldn't ask him for money. And we figured it was probably because they thought he was mafia. Uh, I, if, when I'm with him, I guess I get included in that. I didn't probably look like mafia unless I was the bookkeeper maybe or something. Uh, but... Uh, yeah, so one day we went to the train station because uh, there was a girl, um, college student, that was leaving, and the train station at night is not a safe place, and so we went to escort her there, and uh, it was in the winter, so we had our big puffy jackets on, and uh, we, we saw her off on the train, and then as we're, we were walking away from the, the, the um, rails, we, we ran to a friend of ours named Sergey, and he says, oh, John, Jeremy, uh, it's good to see you. He says, uh, I, I'm meeting somebody here. Wait for me, uh, you know, uh, and then we'll walk back together. And uh, he says, have you guys seen a tall guy in, in a white scarf? And we had seen these, these uh, business-looking guys standing over there, and we said, well, is that him over there? And he said, they said oh, yes, that's him. I just need to go talk to him, um, and then, then, then we'll leave. So we waited off to the side while they had this talk, and we're trying, you know, look tough. We're at the train station, right? And so we're standing there, and um, no idea what's going on, right? But we're waiting for Sergey. He comes back, and, uh, and on the way home, he explains, this was a business associate of his, his boss, and his boss and him had just had an argument, and his boss was leaving for Moscow, and he didn't want to leave things the way that they were, so he came just to make sure that things were were okay between them. And uh, so I said, okay, didn't think anything of it. About a week later, I'm over at Sergei's house, and Sergei gets a call from his boss, returned from Moscow, and his boss said, Sergei, that was such a small argument that we had. I don't know why you needed to bring the mafia with you. And... Sergey explained to him, you know, th- no, those were two California missionaries, Christian guys. And uh, they laughed, and uh, his boss told him, Sergey, uh, you have no idea how close you came to death. Because the guy that was with us uh, was actual mafia. And he thought that, that we had set this up to, to do him in. And uh, the train was late. 
He thought that we had arranged for the train to be late so that we had time then for our thugs, uh, you guys, to come. And so he was looking at John and me the whole time thinking that we're Chechen mafia and that we are going to, to kill him from a, a different mafia group. And so he had his hand on his gun under his jacket the whole time waiting for us to make our move. And we're just standing there trying to look tough, you know, and, stuff. and uh, we could have died at any moment if we just pulled out a snicker or something, you know. Uh, who knows how, how close we came to death. And it reminds me, you know, that in, in life, we look at things from our perspective. And in this story, in, in, in Acts here, it's very easy to look at the natural world and miss the supernatural world, miss what's going on. We were seeing what was going on in the train station from our perspective, from our eyes, and we had no idea there was a whole other reality going on with the mafia. And in life, we go about our day, and we just do our business, and we just see things with our natural eyes, and we're not paying attention to the supernatural reality that is going on around us. And how often do we miss opportunities like Peter and, Jane, Peter and John had here? Because we just keep doing just our thing. Today, we have a Super Bowl you know, and so our, our eyes are on the Super Bowl party or whatever we're going to go to and do this afternoon. And as our eyes are focused on that, as Peter and John were, were, were focused on the prayer meeting they were going to have, how often do we then just doing our thing, aren't acting in prayer, walking in the spirit, looking and say, God, who are you leading me to? And we miss out on opportunities to God, for God to show up in power. And not everybody has the gift of healing. And not everybody has, that doesn't mean that you, you can't heal, um, but, you know, some people are actually called to healing ministries. They have a gift of healing. And so they might be more inclined to speak boldly like, like Peter and J John and say, hey, I don't have gold and silver, but I, what I do have, get up and walk. You know, uh, that might not be like where you feel comfortable. But there's lots of spiritual gifts and a lot of times we only focus on, you know, the really extravagant ones. But some of you have the gift of serving. And so if you have the gift of serving, are you missing opportunities for God to show up in power through your service? Maybe you have the gift of giving. And that's, you know, like uh, I talked about having the, the God pocket thing and pulling, pulling money out. And setting it aside so that you can just be praying, God, who are you leading me to give this money to today? And just be looking for the opportunities for God to show up in power by you just giving somebody a gift. Maybe you have the gift of mercy. And are you praying, God, who do you want me to show mercy to? That's going to meet them in their moment of need, and, and, and God is going to show up in a real way in their life. Maybe you have the gift of exhortation, encouragement, building people up. Maybe you have the gift of prophecy or teaching. Whatever gift you have, are you praying and looking for opportunities to use that gift and for God to show up in power? Are we just operating out of the natural world, or are we, are we looking for God to do something amazing in the spiritual world? It would have been sad for 5,000 people not to have come to know the Lord because Peter and John said, we've got a prayer meeting to get to. You know, here's a couple pieces of silver. Here's a couple coins. And miss the opportunity for the Spirit to work. Uh, it's interesting in this miracle, they said, look at us. Look at us. What was going on there? Well, this guy was obviously not looking at them. He asked them for money, right? But he didn't look at them and ask them for money. Why not? The man felt shame. I mean, all your life, you've been a nobody. You've been just less than everybody. 
Didn't feel like a person. Didn't feel like you contributed anything. Didn't feel like you had worth and value. And Jesus so often, he touched people, right? People that were outcasts, the lepers. He didn't have to touch them to heal them, but so oftentimes he touched them to say, I care about you. I love you. You are a person. I see you. And Peter and John did the same thing. Look at us. You matter. We're looking at you. We care about you. And so often that's, that's how the Holy Spirit wants to use us. There's people that are hurting all around us. There's people hurting here this morning. And are we, lo- are we looking for those opportunities to encourage and speak truth you know, into their lives? As a church, we're called to speak psalms and hymns and spiritual songs to one another, to uplift one another, to speak life into each other. Look at, look at us, they said. And then this miracle happens, and, and all these people come and gather around, and now they're looking at Peter and John. But they're not supposed to be looking at Peter and John, right? He says, why are you looking at us? As if we did this. As if it's not like some power that we had or some piety that we had, like there were some kind of special holy people. It's not about us. And point two, Jesus is always the focus. The focus is not the miracle. The focus is not the Holy Spirit even. The, whole, the, the focus is Jesus always because he is the one who saves. And salvation is ultimately what is important. It's not the miracle. It's great that this guy could walk again. And he got up and walked. And, and you know, some people that Jesus healed, they didn't... Praise God, right? You know, the 10 lepers and only one came back and thanked Jesus. The others were just happy that they could live their life normally. And so, you know, just because a healing happens, just because um, the miraculous happens, doesn't mean that people turn, turn, to, turn, to, turn to Jesus. But that's the, that's the focus. That's what they're supposed to do. Um, uh, you know, so Peter says, when he saw this, he says, the men of Israel, why does this surprise you? This shouldn't even be surprising. Jesus was doing this stuff. And why do you stare at us if by our own power or godliness we had made this man walk? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus. The purpose of the miracle is to glorify Jesus. It's similar also to when Jesus um, healed the man, the paralytic, who they, they, they lowered through the roof, remember? Why did he heal him? It was to show that he had the power to forgive sins. It was confirmation of the message. And again, here, it's confirmation of their message that Jesus is Lord. They go on, as you know, he says in verse 16, on the basis of faith in his name, it is the name of Jesus which has strengthened this man whom you see and know. And the faith which comes through him has given him this perfect health in the presence of you all. It's all about faith in Jesus. That is an important thing. So our job is to deflect, to deflect off of ourselves. Nothing that we should do should draw attention to us. It's so always pff, deflect it to Jesus. Deflect. Uh, that's what John the Baptist did, right? You know, when there's, hey, you know, the people are going to follow this Jesus. He says, I'm not the Christ. That's good. They're supposed to go and follow the Christ. We don't, we're not supposed to draw people to ourselves, draw people to Jesus. Point three, then, in a sermon... Uh, he, he says an, uh, an interesting thing here um, in verse 14 and 15. It says, you disowned the holy and righteous one and asked that a murderer be released to you. Okay, so you, you disowned Jesus, asked for a murderer, Barabbas, to be released to you. And in doing so, you killed the author of life. So you chose a murderer over the author of life. But God raised him from the dead, and we are witnesses of this. Too many people today are choosing death 
over life. Don't choose death over life. How do we choose death over life? We choose the pleasures of this world, right? Our focus is on this life, on the, 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 what, what, how I can make myself comfortable and happy and everything in this life. And James talks about that in James 5, verse 5 and 6. He says, you have lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fattened yourselves in the day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered innocent men who are not opposing you. And they've traded, you know, James is saying you've traded uh, life for death by seeking the pleasures of this world, self-indulgence. The church can get focused on this. I mean, we, we can do it individually. We can try and just make a perfect life for ourselves. And then we're not living on mission. But the church can also do that as a church. We can become just so self-absorbed. We talked about this last week. We, we need to be inward and outward. The church can easily become a social club and just be about self-preservation and trying to keep our church alive and existing, right? Um, and th that's not what we're about, we need to have fellowship. We need to have unity. We need to be a family. We need to enjoy each other. But we cannot become a social club. We've got to be on mission, a family on mission. Uh, there's a famous story. Thomas Aquinas, who's a great um, Christian uh, leader, author, philosopher, everything. Thomas Aquinas, a uh, long time ago, oh, he's an ancient guy. He met with Pope Innocent III. In, uh, in Rome, and, and the Pope showed him the splendor of the Vatican, right? How beautiful it was and how much money they have. Trying to impressing, trying to impress Thomas Aquinas. And uh, he says, you see, Thomas, the church can no longer say silver and gold have I none. To which Thomas replied, true, Holy Father, and neither can she say, rise and walk. We can become so self-absorbed, so much about protecting ourselves and having, that we lose the power of what God's called us to do, the power of the Holy Spirit to work in our lives because we're off mission. We've got to stay on mission. Or what we're doing is no good. It's worthless. It's powerless. We don't want to have a form of godliness. That we look godly on the outside, this appearance, but we're dead on the inside. And there's no power. So don't choose death over life. And then, you know, he goes on. And he says in verse 17, Now, brothers, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did your leaders. Point four, ignorance is no excuse. Ignorance is no excuse. I mean, you look at this, and he says, Now, brothers, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did your leader. So is that okay? You know, you, yeah, you killed Jesus, but I, you, you were ignorant. You didn't know what you were doing. Kids, ignorance doesn't mean you're not smart. It means you did not know, right? So these guys were they acted in ignorance, Peter says. You did not know what you were doing when you killed Jesus. Right? Jesus prayed that on the cross. Uh, when he was on the cross being crucified, he said, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they're doing. Right? Father, forgive them. They are ignorant. Right? And, and Peter's saying that here. He says, now, brothers, I know that you acted in ignorance as did your leaders, but this is how God fulfilled what he foretold through all the prophets, saying that his Christ would suffer. You should have known that this was going to happen. You shouldn't have been ignorant, but you were ignorant. Okay. Now, what do you do about it? It's not an excuse, but it's excusable, right? Because he goes on in verse 19, then. Repent then 
and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. Okay, you didn't know what you were doing. But now I'm telling you what you did. Now you're seeing the resurrection power. You're seeing what Jesus said that, uh, you know, an evil and adulterous generation seeks a sign. I'm not going to give you a sign to prove who I am except for this, the sign of Jonah, that as the son of man was, as Jonah was in the, in the belly of the whale for three days and three nights, so the son of man will be raised from the dead. He'll be in the, gra- in the, in the grave for three days and three nights. Right? That's my proof. I will rise from the dead. And now we have Peter and John and the early Christians that are the, the apostles that are witnesses and testimony, uh, t- giving, testifying about this, that Jesus rose from the dead. We're seeing the resurrection power in Jesus. You saw us heal this guy just like Jesus did. So yeah, you killed him, but he's not dead. And he's alive through us and through our message. And so now you better understand what you did, and repent. Nobody on the day of judgment is going to be able to say, well, I did not know. And God says, oh, you were ignorant. Okay, you can come in. Ignorance is no excuse. Why, why do I say that? In Romans 1, 18, familiar verse, I'm sure, Paul says, the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen being understood from what has been made so that men are without excuse. There's a lot of people who seem to be ignorant of God, you know, atheists and agnostics and such. But they're they're not. It's just they've suppressed the truth. There's a lot of people that are suppressing the truth with their wickedness because in their wickedness, they want to live how they want to live. They don't want anybody to tell them how they ought to live. They don't want to have to conform their life to any other moral standard that's out there. They want to just do what they want to do. And so uh, this is true of mankind in all of our history that we suppress the truth in righteousness. What has been... Enough is revealed about God for people to be saved. People are without excuse. And we see this happening too, you know, like not everybody has a missionary come to them. Not everybody has the gospel and we need to be on that. But even in places where people have seen, okay, there must be a God. They start seeking after this God because as, this, as Paul says here, it's plain and evident to them there is a God. If they are willing to seek him, God will reveal himself. And we see this happening in Muslim countries and places where missionaries can't get in. People are having visions of Jesus. God is appearing to people in dreams. The miraculous is happening. Uh, and so people are without excuse. Ignorance is no excuse. So... Uh, we've got a job to do, though, because people need to hear the gospel, and God has given us the commission. He's not appearing to everybody in a dream, and uh, we have a mission to go and share the good news. There are people that are dying. There are people that need to know the truth. And and Peter says in his sermon, uh, not just will this save you from wrath, but um, you get to experience the presence of Jesus. Right? Uh, this is re- he calls it the re- refreshing presence of Jesus. Repent now and experience the refreshment that comes from knowing Jesus. This promise that was given to Abraham. Right? Through Abraham, all the nations of the world will be blessed. That was a, that was a, a prophecy of the Messiah. The, the seed of Abraham, Jesus, through him, all the nations would be blessed. 
There's a blessing that God wants to give. We're his agents. We need to get our eyes off of the natural world and look for the open doors. Be praying for the open doors. Be looking for the spiritual reality that's going on. Satan has his blinders on different people's lives. Satan is, is, is hurting people, causing people to suffer. You know, people are, you might have an easy life. I, we were just watching the movie Billy Elliot yesterday, and it was making me think of this. I don't, it's an old movie, uh, but about a young boy who ends up wanting to be a dancer in Ireland, and it was not a cool thing. His dad was a coal miner. He lived in a family that, was really poor, abusive, um, because you know not not uh, really isn't a fault of the of the father, uh, but he was going through hard times. His wife had died, and um, he was angry. And the coal miners were on strike; they were living in poverty, and he's trying to take care of his family, and he's frustrated. And sometimes, you know, he took that anger out by lashing out at his kids. Lived in this, Billy Elliot lived in this home that was just horrible. And I think about how many people don't live in a nice, happy home like I live in. And how I don't oftentimes see that or think about that. And I, I kind of assume that everybody has the same kind of upbringing that I have. And... and we need to have our hearts breaking for people. We need to be looking for the, and, and asking for the Holy Spirit to give us supernatural eyes to see the reality that's going on and the hurts that are out there and how we can help. You've all been given gifts. If you're a believer, you have the Holy Spirit. He's given you gifts. How are you using those gifts? To one, build up the body of Christ, but two, to lead people to Jesus. Let's pray. Lord, we ask simply that you open our eyes. Open our eyes, Lord. Help us to see people like you see them. Open our hearts to love people like you love them. And as you gave us the ultimate example of love in, in, in dying on the cross for us, giving your whole life for us, I pray that you help us to pour, our, pour out ourselves as a drink offering, as a sacrifice for others. To not be so concerned about our well-being, but the well-being of others. Whether that's physical needs, spiritual needs, ultimately we want people to be complete and full in their knowledge of you, knowing you as their Lord and Savior. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we're going to take communion now. Something we had to do um, as a church. Wonderful blessing that we have. So I, as I'm talking here, you might want to try working that cellophane off the top because it uh, can be a challenge. And, uh, for those who haven't done this yet, there's a cellophane on the top. There's a little wafer there that you want to get out first. Give you a moment to, to get that. <clears throat> Communion is, a, is an expression of unity. Uh, it's something that we, we do as a church. It unites us in our purpose. Uh, we are believers, and if you're a believer here, even if you don't go to our church, uh, you're welcome to take communion along with us because we're all, uh, we're all one body in Christ. 
but we recognize that, that we've been unified in the Lord um, and we are on mission with him uh, to share the good news of his death and resurrection until he comes. So remember with the, with the bread that uh, Jesus gave his body for us. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for sending your son. We thank you that Jesus died for us on the cross. He didn't care about his own life. He loved us. loved us so much, saw us as valuable people created in his image that he created. He was the author of life. He is the author of life. But he had to die to give us that eternal life. And we thank you. This morning we thank you. Amen. Paul said, for I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you, the Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. supper he took the cup saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me for whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes take and drink Jesus, we thank you for the new covenant in your blood. The new covenant that can wash away every sin from our lives and make us white as snow. A new covenant that doesn't say that every time we sin, we need to take a sacrifice, an animal to the temple, but you were the Passover lamb. You paid the price once and for all for our sins and can give us peace and life in you that can restore a relationship with our Heavenly Father, that can reconcile us to you, the one that can, can justify us and say, it is just as if you've never sinned, that you look at us perfectly, blamelessly. You're perfect and blameless in your eyes, not because of anything that we did, but because of what you did for us. And Lord, if there's anybody who's listening today, who's never given their life to you, who's never seen the truth, or has been rejecting it, has never experienced life in you, I pray that today would be the day of salvation. If that's you, I just ask you to pray, pray this along with me. Lord, I recognize that I'm a sinner. That because of my sin, I deserve death. But I recognize and believe that you sent Jesus to die on the cross for me and that his death is sufficient. His death pays the price for my sins and I can be made new in him. And, I, and today I make him the savior. I accept salvation. He is my savior and, I'm, and, I, and I declare him as Lord. He is the Lord of my life, and I recognize that, and I will live for him and not for myself. I give you my all. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand and worship with us as, yeah, we're just worshiping a God. Um, we believe that his blood is strong enough to cover all of our sins. And when we mess up, I feel like, 
at least my life, I'm looking for God to like have this like vengeful, like, oh my goodness, you messed up. Well, you're done. But it's every single time he says, no, like you fell down, but like, all right, let's get up. Let's try again. Like if he's a good father, what father's going to like look at their child when they fall off their bike and be like, oh, well, okay, you're done now. Like, no, he's going to say, all right, let's get up. Let's try again. And like, that's just, if we're not like receiving that, then we need a new, like, like, like revelation of who Jesus is and who God is. Like, so yeah, let's just worship that God who uses broken people and his blood is so powerful that like he, like he uses broken people to partner with him, which is just crazy. So yeah, let's just worship him today and give him our all. i 
A couple of our uh, members aren't um, here this morning, uh, Stan and Esther App, and I just got word before the service and just got permission to, to share this. Uh, Esther's mother, Alma, went home to be with the Lord uh, this morning. She had got COVID uh, about a week ago. I'm not exactly sure when, but she was on oxygen <clears throat> this week. Things were looking a little bit better Friday, took a turn for the worse yesterday, and we just found out. This morning that she she'd passed. So if you'd uh, lift up Stan and Esther, it's Esther's mother. Um, let's pray together. 
Lord, um, we thank you for Stan and Esther, the care that they've uh, showed uh, to her mother and uh, the love that she received from them and saw you in them. And she's home with you now, and we're grateful for that. But we pray for your comfort for Stan and Esther and the rest of the family. We thank you that we have a body of believers, a family of God that can come together and wrap our, our arms around one another, that we don't have to walk this life alone, but you have united us together in you. We are brothers and sisters. And Father, I pray for those who still don't know you, that they had come to know you before it's too late. We don't know what tomorrow holds. And so we ask that you open people's eyes, you convict them so that they, they choose you today. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's close with our doxology. your day with spiritual eyes. Have a blessed one.